you know me, right? I'm all about performance. That is retro computer CPU performance. But you knew that, right? Yes, on today's Al's Geek Lab, I'm going to show you how I'm going to take that uh, IBM PC XT, that old thing that would sit around 4.77 megahertz, and then I popped a 386 processor in it, courtesy of the Intel inboard. That's a few videos back. If you haven't seen that, then you should definitely check that out before following along with this video, because today I'm going to take that and whop it right up. I'm going to put in a 486 processor and I see how our mileage varies. And maybe if I'm still not satisfied with the sheer performance might of that processor, maybe I'll do something else. So stay tuned. That's all coming up on Al's Geek Lab. Before we move on with the video, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to PCB Way for supporting Al's Geek Lab. Whether you're recreating a vintage motherboard or testing a fresh microcontroller idea, PCB Way will turn your Gerber files into polished boards in just a few days. Pick your solder mask color, add silkscreen, and if you like, let their team handle full component assembly so it arrives ready to boot. And guess what? You can get started from just $5. And if you need more than just PCBs, they also offer CNC machining, 3D printing, and sheet metal work, all from the same dashboard. Visit their website today at PCBWay.com. We'd like to thank PCBWay for keeping our projects powered. Now, let's get back to the video. So I finally got that Intel inboard 386 PC. And this is an earlier shot of me installing it in the PC. Now, obviously the XT itself or the PC ran at 4.77 megahertz. And I was dubious as to find out if this really would increase the performance of the machine, but it absolutely did. It really stacked up for its money. So on speed test 600, for example, it believed that the machine was now a 20 megahertz AT. Not quite, but it reckoned it clocked in at 19.79 megahertz anyway. Again, that's not accurate, but it was still pretty nifty to see that sort of a number running on a machine that was, remember, 4.77 megahertz. Check it came in at 2986 dry stones on the CPU, which is 15.99 megahertz, which is about right. The math score, which is important because we're going to put an FPU in this machine today, check it came in at 62.6 whetstones with no numeric processing unit. Norton Sysinfo was 16 megahertz right down the line, and Top Bench compared it to that of a PS250Z 286-10 PC. So interesting performance figures. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to say, nah, that's not enough. I need more power. And the first of those power upgrades is the 486. Now, I'm not talking any Intel run-of-the-mill i486 here. No, I'm talking specifically the CX486 DLC. Why specifically this chip, you may ask? I'm assuming that Intel didn't have hot rodders like me when in mind when they made the Intel inboard 386. They were like, well, we've already upgraded your XT to a 386, so come on, you don't want any more than that. That would just be silly. And yes, it would be silly, but they probably weren't thinking about what it would be like in 2025 to use this. The Cyrix CX486 DLC is basically a package chip, so it's got the same pin out as the 386. But what you get on it is a 486 off sort. It's not quite as good as a 486SX. It's eh, somewhere in between, right? But it does have in its favor are a few things, like it's got an onboard 1K, 1K of cache. So it's level one cache. And um, apparently it's two times faster than the 386DX at the same clock frequency. So um, it boasts that Landmark 2.0 runs at 130 megahertz or at 40 megahertz or Norton Sysinfo 6 came up at 66 megahertz at 40 megahertz and, and so on and so forth. So it said that, yeah, this is a great um, upgrade for your 386 based machine. And of course, they weren't really thinking about that when they were talking about the um, inboard. Of course, they were thinking about people who had normal 386 based PCs. And of course, if it was a normal 386 machine, then I'm certain 
that it would involve a lot of performance increase and probably worth your money if you weren't in the position of buying a whole brand new 486 motherboard and 486 CPU. This would have definitely been a cost saving exercise for that extra power that you might want from a 486. So I believe that the 486 DLC is pretty easy to get these days on eBay and so forth. And the great thing is it's a drop in replacement. It does give you some performance increase. There is also the 486 DLC or 486 SLC from Texas Instruments. It's basically the same thing, a bit more cash on it though. So again, it should go faster, a little bit harder to find. Um, and then there's the 486 DRX2. Now that one there is a clock double DLC class part, so apparently that one would be quite a bit faster, but these are rarer than hen's teeth. So if you're in the market for one, you've got some money and you want to have a 386DX upgrade, then this one here would be a nice sweet spot because all you have to do is literally take out the old 386 CPU and pop in one of these CPUs. There's also the Intel Rapid CAD as well, but um, I haven't seen any of those on the market and they don't have uh, a level one cache. So really, the only benefit of those would be the FPU heavy workloads. So here's a helpful little graph which I got ChatGPT5 to make for me. Um, hopefully it is correct, that looks about right. But on it, you can see all of the drop-in replacements for the Intel inboard 386. Anyway, enough chatting time. It's time to go ahead and replace that chip. And of course, it is as easy as it looks. You simply take out that inboard out of the machine, pull off the Intel 386, which was pretty stuck in there. I must say it needed a little bit of coaxing gently before it would come loose and then pop in the replacement. And it was as easy as that. But now you're wondering, well, how does it perform? We have screen, VGA. Whoa. Now on our previous landmark running the old CPU, we got 20 megahertz and this time we're getting 32. Also, this is the performance based on no level one cache being enabled on this chip. Also, it finds it is a 486DX when in actuality it's more like a SX processor no floating point unit. Next up was chicken of course and previously we got 2986 dry stones on this new CPU we got 3234 but oddly 130 megahertz CPU compared to the 16 megahertz CPU of past so that was cool and also in the math speed uh, we got an indication of 50.7k whetstones which was actually less than the previous 62.6 whetstone. So also quite an interesting figure. Now, there's a few things to bear in mind when looking at all the speed here. It looks like the speed has increased, but the figures are all weird and janky. And there's a few things to take stock of here. First of all, the Intel inboard 3D6 itself, right? That has a clock on it. That's a physical oscillator crystal oscillator and that crystal is clocked in at 32 megahertz so basically there's a divider which takes the cpu speed down to 16 megahertz so regardless of what else is going on the cpu speed is still told to be 16 megahertz there's a few things otherwise going on at play here the cpu itself has got some extra bells and whistles and tricks and also it's got that level one cache. It's a small cache, admittedly, it's only 1k, but 1k can make a lot of difference when we're talking about these old low end machines. So, how about that cache? By default, it's not enabled. Now we need to enable that. Naturally, there isn't a heck of a lot of information on the internet about enabling the level one cache on an Intel inboard 386. So, I had a good old look on various websites, first of all one called Ardent, and there is a download of a Linux-based tool that was ported to DOS, so I downloaded that one, and then I also downloaded um, some other tools from Phil's Computer Lab, 
which is an excellent YouTube channel if you haven't checked out Phil's Computer Lab. He's another um, follically challenged gentleman like myself and does very similar things with retro computers. So he also had the, the Cyrix 486 DLC and he put it through its paces on a 386 motherboard. Obviously, I'm not doing quite the same. I have an inboard which is on a PC XT motherboard. So quite a big difference. But anyway, you can see Phil's website here and he has a copy of the, I think, official Cyrix um, tools that would enable the cache and all sorts of other CPU flags. So first things first, obviously, I copied over the files using FTP and then ran the CX486 uh, utility. Now this here shows all of the flags of the CPU, it shows what's in the sort of registers and everything. It's quite quite cool actually. It shows a lot of internal information about a CPU that usually you wouldn't get to see. This CD bit of the CPU shows about the cache status, basically internal cache enable or disable. And so when it's at zero, it means the cache is enabled. So that is good. And there's a whole bunch of other settings you can go on to as well. For example, specific to the cache configuration register, you can switch on NCO, NC1, and so forth. Having a good play around with all the different settings, it was time to go back to the cache configuration register flags. And as you can see here, there's an NCO, NC1, A20, and so forth. I spent a lot of time on the internet looking into different things. Apparently, there's different motherboards work differently with the flush setting and also with the barb setting. And A20 is to do with the A20 gate for the keyboard control. So those Ken flush and barb settings are all slightly different and depends on the type of motherboard that you have but basically it all comes down to enabling the cache in the right particular way for your motherboard. And I spent a very long time like fiddling with all of these settings, trying to make it work. But in the end, and I can't remember where from, I found out that effectively the inboard itself does not recognize a cache because it was kind of made at a time before CPUs had caches. So it kind of makes a lot of sense, to be honest with you. So, yep, after all that, I'm basically getting a CPU which has a cache but cannot be enabled on the Intel inboard 3D6. That's a bit sad, but in the end, does this CPU increase the performance of the Intel inboard at all? And the answer is yes. Could it be even better? Yes. So let's put a 387, so a math coprocessor, onto this thing too. And for those applications which could take a coprocessor and understand its use, that's going to boost the performance. As you can see here, installation of the 387 is a piece of cake too. It's just simply drop it in and off it goes. I went with a 387DX20 because obviously the clock speed right now is just 16 megahertz, so it doesn't really matter whether it's faster or equivalent. So after plugging in, quick check in Check It. Looks like the math coprocessor is working just fine at 1126.1 whetstones. You know what that means, right? It means it's time for Doom. Okay, well, it's not exactly wonderful here, as you can see, it's uh, on low detail. But you can improve the detail and you can improve the window size and it still looks kind of okay. Um, but one thing that you you would find out very quickly is that when you start the game, you can't play it with the keyboard. So even though the speed is pretty rubbish, unfortunately, a nuance of the um, A20 gate handler, which is basically in the AT and above, that's non-existent in the XT. And so as a result, you can't play Doom with the keyboard. You can with the joystick or with the mouse, but you can't with the keyboard. And this is a problem that I don't think is solvable. Anyway, it shows that Doom is sort of playable on an XT, which 
I know it's not really an XT anymore with this board in it, but still the fact that you can actually run Doom on something of this age is, well, just crazy. Right, so what have we done? We've taken a 4.77 MHz PC, turned it into a 16 MHz 386, then upgraded it to a, what, 32 MHz or something 486 CPU. I don't know really how many megahertz it is because it's still got that oscillator on it which is 32 megahertz divided in two to give you 16 but yet you've got the 486 power so you've actually got a better machine and so anyway it's faster. And then we put the FPU on it which gave us that little extra when you have a program or a game that actually knows how to use the FPU. So all things considered, it's definitely a lot faster than it ever was, um, but I'm still not convinced that this is the top limit. Now we are limited by a number of things on the XT. Of course, it is an 8-bit bus. It is an ISA bus, and there's a lot of other uh, ICs on the motherboard itself that just won't run faster when they need to be pushed faster. So we've got those things that are we're constrained with. All things considered, it's going to be a difficult case to get this machine to run much faster. But I think I can do it. And here's how. With the help of my Patreon supporters, and by the way, if you do want to help the channel out, go over to patreon.com forward slash Lab, And uh, yeah, it'd be great to have you join us there. There's lots of extra cool stuff over there, lots of early content as well. But anyway, with the help of my Patreon supporters, I bought this thing for, well, too much money. But basically it's called a Blue Lightning, and the Blue Lightning is the IBM chip, which basically upgraded from a 386 to a 486 uh, with a clock speed of up to 96 megahertz. I think it's possible that we're probably going to get somewhere around four times 20 megahertz, so 80 megahertz. I think what this has as well is an interposer and a coprocessor on it, which allows us to obtain cache, most importantly. So through the use of cache and with doubling of the clock on the actual board, that means that we won't have to do anything special other than upgrade the BIOS. And that is gonna be in the next video. So stay tuned for part two of this video only here on Al's Geek Lab. In the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you have, press the thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and get us over on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Al's Geek Lab. Until next time, thanks very much for watching and be excellent to each other. Bye for now.